Well, good evening. I hate to cut you off from that wonderful video, but I do have a presentation that I'd like to, um, to go ahead and start. So the first thing I'd like to know is if all of you can actually hear me. Um, can someone please uh, just type something in the chat box and let me know if you can actually hear me? I would highly appreciate it. Yes, Diane Castro, thank you so much. So welcome, uh, my name is Mark Gallette and I am a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. I'm going to explain the program in just a moment, but I do want to introduce myself for those uh, who may not know me. Again, my name is Mark Gallette. Um, I am a sociology professor at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida. I am a native of Central Florida. I've lived here my whole life. And um, I've been teaching sociology courses at Valencia College now for about 25 years. Um, I have invited um, people, patrons from libraries all over the country. And so I appreciate you taking part of your day to spend uh, with me. Uh, if you could please subscribe to my YouTube channel, I would highly appreciate it. Um, also, this is very important to me if you feel comfortable doing it. If you are on a laptop or a desktop or on some type of a tablet like an iPad, you should see on the right hand side of your uh, screen, there's a live chat where you can, you can um, put your comments and you can uh, ask me questions at any time. If you feel comfortable doing so, would you mind telling me how you heard about this program? Um, if you heard it through a library, if you wouldn't mind telling me the name of the library, uh, if you heard it some other place, if you wouldn't mind just chatting in the box and telling me where you heard it, I would really highly appreciate it. Also, at any time during the presentation, if you have any questions or concerns, please type them in the chat box. And what I'm going to do is periodically I'm going to take a look at what's in the chat box and try to answer questions as we go along to try to make this as interactive as possible. Um, you will see me going like this periodically and the reason that I'm going like this is because I'm looking at my tablet and I'm looking at uh, any questions that you might have for me. So it's not that I'm ignoring you, I just want to kind of stay on top of the questions. If for some reason I overlook your question, and I think it might be very easy for me to do that, I apologize, but please um, bring it up at the end. I'm going to have questions and answers and bring it up again because I definitely want to make sure that I have your questions, get your questions answered. So again, I appreciate you so much for coming tonight. And um, I do want to warn you that my guess is I'm probably going to go over an hour. I get very excited and very passionate about what I'm getting ready to talk about. And so it's very easy for me to go on and on. So if you have to leave, I certainly understand that. I will not be offended. You can always come back to my YouTube channel um, at a later time. Uh, normally within 24 hours of one of these live events ending, the video will be archived on the channel. So you can come back and catch what you weren't able to see. So um, let me um, tell you a little bit about the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador Program. It is a joint venture between NASA and JPL located out in Pasadena, California. And the Solar System Ambassador Program, in lack of other words, is kind of a fancy way of saying I'm a volunteer, an unpaid volunteer. I do not work for NASA. I don't get any type of pay for doing this. So you might be asking, why is a sociology professor doing a presentation about space and NASA? Well, uh, quite frankly, I'm just extremely excited and very fascinated by our space program. Anything to do with space exploration to me is absolutely fascinating. So I was fortunate enough to be uh, selected by NASA last year to become a solar system ambassador. And what I generally do is go out to local uh, libraries and community centers and do my presentations live. Well, as you know, with COVID-19, uh, all of those facilities are currently closed. So we were asked if we would be willing to do some type of uh, event like I'm hosting now. And I thought, you know, 
I think this might be a great thing. So this is my third one, if I recall properly. So this is something still relatively new to me. And um, so forgive me if everything doesn't go quite as smoothly as you think that it should go, but I think that I've worked out most of the kinks. So uh, I think we should have a pretty good time. I've got some videos for you. I wanna demonstrate some really cool software that is extremely exciting. Uh, I'll do that software demonstration near the end of the presentation, so I hope that you can stick with me. Specifically, I'm going to talk about what's called NASA Eyes, and it's just incredible software. And if you're in the space and space exploration, um, which I assume that you are because you're here, uh, I think you're going to find it really, really exciting. So welcome to my presentation, and we're going to go ahead and get started with... Um, looking at a history of NASA. I do want to mention that I have two more upcoming YouTube live events that will also include interactive live chat. Uh, the next one is on Thursday, June the 25th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I've entitled that What's Up at NASA. And the second one that I have scheduled is on Tuesday, July the 28th from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. That one is entitled, Is There Life Beyond Earth? And so what I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to, once a month, put together some type of YouTube live event that has something to do with NASA or space, and I hope that you will join me. Um, and if you have any topics in mind that you'd like me to present on, feel free to put them in the chat box at any time. All right, so... NASA. So NASA was established back in 1958. And here's our brief, agenda, uh, our brief agenda about NASA tonight. We're going to talk about the past. We're going to talk about the Apollo program and the STS or the Space Shuttle program. And then we're going to talk about, well, what's happening now? We're going to talk about the International Space Station. We're going to talk about some satellites, landers, and rovers. We're going to talk about the commercial crew program, and there's something very, very exciting happening in eight days when it comes to NASA's, NASA's commercial crew program. I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with U.S. astronauts launching to the International Space Center from Kennedy Space Center. And then we'll spend some time talking about the future. Well, what is NASA planning? We'll talk about the James Webb Space Telescope the Space Launch System, and the Orion Capsule, which is part of what's called the Artemis Program. We will talk about something that was just released a few days ago by NASA, the, the Moon Human Landing Systems. And then we're going to wrap it up with Experience NASA Yourself for me showing you uh, things like NASA Eyes that I was talking about earlier, very exciting. And then we're going to end with questions and answers. All right, so... NASA was established in 1958, and there were a few programs that led up to the Apollo program. Project Mercury was from 1958 to 1963, and one of the major objectives of Project Mercury was to put American astronauts into space. Keep in mind that there was a space race between America and the Russians, and so that program was very focused on getting American astronauts into space. The Mercury program was followed by Project Gemini. That was from 1961 to 1966. And Project Gemini was focused on testing systems, software and hardware systems, for the upcoming Apollo program. And then we come to, of course, the Apollo program. The Apollo program was from 1961 and ended in 1972. And I want to highlight some of the major accomplishments of the Apollo program. Apollo 1, unfortunately, January 27, 1967, we lost three astronauts, Roger Chaffee, Ed White, and Gus Grissom. There was a fire that broke out in the capsule during a test on the launch pad, and they were unable to escape. So unfortunately, we did lose those three astronauts. But it was not in vain because NASA decided to push forward with our landing of humans on the moon. So Apollo 8, December 1968, 
This was the first time that humans orbited the moon. And of course, perhaps the most famous of all the Apollo program missions, Apollo 11, when man landed on the moon, July 20th, 1969. And so the 50th anniversary was celebrated just about one year ago. Apollo 13, the famous Apollo 13, if you've not seen the movie with Tom Hanks in it called Apollo 13, came out in 1995, I highly recommend it. It's a very interesting movie that talks all about what went wrong and what went right with Apollo 13. There was an explosion when they were steering, steering the oxygen tanks and you don't want an explosion in space because things are not going to go well. And then Apollo 17, that ended up being the last Apollo mission. And so Gene Cernan was the last man to walk on the moon and he left on December 14th, 1972. There were six landings on the moon, 12 men. Unfortunately, there were three Apollo program missions canceled, Apollo 18, 19, and 20. And how and why it was canceled? Unfortunately, there were two major reasons. Number one, the public lost interest in us going to the moon. I don't understand that. I don't know how people can lose interest in something like that, but that's the case. And the second thing is that Congress cut NASA's funding, so they had to cancel the rest of the program. All right, I have a short little video here about the 50th anniversary of astronauts landing on the moon. seconds and counting, we are go for Apollo 7 at this time. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on 5, 4, 3, 2. Person, uh, From 1969 to 1972, we had you know, a total of six moon landings. Twelve humans walked on the surface of the moon. We have elevated the human condition. We have improved human lives. We have raised the standard of living for every person on Earth because of space exploration. All right, isn't that exciting? So I see a question in the chat box about the James Webb Space Telescope when it's coming online. It's going to be coming online hopefully next year, and I will be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope a little bit later, so we'll come back to that. All right, so when the Apollo program ended um, uh, in 1972, uh, there was going to be the Space Shuttle program. I do want to show on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the Saturn V rocket. It was called Saturn V because it had five main engines. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the command module of Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon. And so if you want to actually see that command module, you can go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., as it is on display there. One more thing before we talk about the space shuttle program. This is kind of a cool little graphic here. Uh, each program or mission at NASA has a patch. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you see the patch for all six Apollo landings, along with the actual uh, uh, 
uh, dates and times of what was occurring down in the bottom right hand corner. So I'll let you take a look at that. You can see where all of the Apollo uh, landers landed on the moon. One thing that you might see that they have in common is that they are all relatively close to the equator. And I like to point it out because a little bit later in the presentation, I'm going to be talking about the Artemis program, which is our return to the moon. And instead of going to the equator, we will be going to the South Pole. All right, and that's going to be a major difference. And the reason that we're going to the South Pole is because there is a, a water ice, and that water ice can be used both for, of course, sustaining the astronauts, and also it can be used for propulsion of spacecraft if the hydrogen is separated from the oxygen. All right, so there you go. All right, so the Apollo program ended, and the space shuttle program uh, was the next major program at NASA. The space shuttle program started in 1981. Well, that was the first launch. It actually started back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the planning. But the first launch was Space Shuttle Columbia in April of 1981, April 12, 1981 to be exact, when Space Shuttle Columbia launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And the last shuttle uh, to land was Atlantis, uh, which you see on the right-hand side of your screen there. It landed in July, uh, July 11, 2011 at Kennedy Space Center, and that was the end of the space shuttle program. There were 135 total missions. Uh, the space shuttle would uh, orbit in low Earth orbit, about 250 miles above the Earth, traveling at about 17,500 17, miles per hour. There were five space shuttles, the original one, Columbia, I've already mentioned that. Unfortunately, uh, there was a major accident, and on February 1st, 2003, when uh, re-entering orbit and getting ready to land at Kennedy Space Center, it disintegrated above Texas and Louisiana. After much investigation, they determined that what happened was during launch, some foam fell on the leading edge of the left, left side of this wing here, and it broke, it, it exposed it. And so when they were landing, heat built up and it started on fire and it exploded. So we did lose seven astronauts in that Columbia disaster. There was also Space Shuttle Challenger. Challenger unfortunately exploded 73 seconds after launch on January 28, 1986. Through much investigation, it was determined that the uh, SRB or the solid rocket booster O-rings, one specifically, had a leak and that leak caused the explosion. We lost seven astronauts in that disaster as well. There were three remaining orbiters or shuttles, Discovery, Endeavor, and Atlantis. And I'll talk about where they are in retirement in just one moment. Got a space shuttle launch video that I'd like to show you. I'm going to fast forward it a little bit and we'll just look at it for just a moment. So let me get it to the point that I'd like it to be at. And that is right there. Data recorders are activated. And the handoff to Atlantis's onboard computers. Atlantis now in control of the countdown. 20. Firing chain is armed. Sound suppression water system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. Six, five, three, two, one, zero, and liftoff of 
Hawk Space Shuttle and Lance on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Houston now controlling. Atlantis begins its penultimate journey to shore up the International Space Station. Atlantis now in the proper alignment for its eight and a half minute ride to orbit. Four and a half million pounds of hardware and humans taking aim on the International Outpost. 30 seconds into the flight, Atlantis almost... If you have never seen a launch, it is definitely something that you want to put on your bucket list. If you're here watching this presentation about NASA tonight and you have not seen a rocket launch, again, you definitely have to put it on your bucket list. I am fortunate that I have a friend that worked at Kennedy Space Center, um, an engineer. She did work there, uh, Leslie, and um, she invited me a couple times out to watch some launches. And Though uh, it's been relatively recent, it was a SpaceX and then a ULA launch. Um, incredible. Just there, there are no words to describe how exciting it is to watch a rocket launch from three miles from a pad. Uh, I do have a few videos that I took during those opportunities to see uh, launches on my YouTube channel. So when we're all done here, if you go look them up, uh, you can see the experience that I had. Just so exciting, and I, again, I do highly recommend it. All right, quick little video here about a space shuttle landing, and um, that was what one of the major things that was unique about the space shuttle program was that it launched like a rocket, but it landed like a plane. But when it landed like a plane, unlike a plane, it didn't have engines for the astronauts to use to make the landing. It was basically a glider, so they had to get it right. And if they didn't get it right, things were not going to end very well at all. Fortunately, with the 135 missions that they had with the space shuttle, they never had a problem. It was always a relatively good landing. So here's a, here's a landing video. Main gear touchdown. Pilot Jim Dutton now deploying the drag shoe. Nose gear touchdown. All right, isn't that cool? Three remaining space shuttles. Atlantis is on display at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. If you've not ever been to Kennedy Space Center, the Visitor Complex, I highly recommend it. So many interesting exhibits all about the space program and especially the Atlantis on display. It's the real thing. It's not a mock-up. Uh, it is the actual space shuttle that you can walk right up to and get a really good look at it. If you go out to California or you live in that area, you can go to the California Science Center in Los Angeles and see the Space Shuttle Endeavor on display. Now, right now on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that they basically just kind of have it in the middle of a building. Once they get all the funding that they need, they are going to build a uh, structure to make it look like it's actually launching in the space. They're going to take a mock um, fuel tank and solid rocket boosters, mount it to the Endeavour shuttle and put it upright. So it's going to be really, really neat once they get it done. The third uh, remaining shuttle uh, that's not pictured, pictured is the Space Shuttle Discovery, which is located at the National Air and Space Museum near Dulles International Airport in Virginia. All right. So, that's a little bit about the history of NASA. Now let's talk about, well, what's happening now, and then we're going to follow it up with, well, what's coming very, very soon. The very first time that I saw what you're looking at on the screen, I was shocked. 
I knew that NASA was doing a lot of things. Of course, everyone knows about the Apollo program and the space shuttle program. We sometimes hear about something going to the going to Mars or something roaming around the Earth. But take a look at this. Uh, this has a lot of information on it. Um, these are all of the current or planned missions that NASA has. So, for example, here we have the Earth, and we have all these satellites that are collecting data about Earth sciences. Uh, there's the International Space Station there. I'll be talking about that shortly. Here we have the, Earth, the Earth's moon. Uh, we have the Artemis program coming up, our return to the moon, hopefully by 2024. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Over here we have a galaxy. We have the James Webb Space Telescope that is scheduled to be launched next year. I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, we have the Spitzer Space Telescope that was retired not very long ago, just a few weeks ago. We have the Hubble Space Telescope. I'll be talking about that in just a moment as well. We transition to look at what, well, what is NASA doing when it comes to our star, the sun. Many, many different programs or missions that are being held. Probably the most famous one is the Parker Solar Probe. When I show you eyes on NASA at the very end of today's presentation, I'm going to show you that you can look up exactly where Parker Probe has been and where it's going and where it is currently at. So collecting all kinds of really neat information and data regarding our star, the sun. We have planets over here and we have uh, missions like, for example, we have Curiosity. I'll speak about that in a moment. We've got the exciting Mars 2020 rover, which has recently, just recently been renamed Endurance. And I'll be talking about that. That's launching in July from... Uh, from Cape Canaveral. And then you have, of course, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, launched back in the 1970s, but they're still going. And I'll tell you a little bit more about them later on. So lots and lots of things that NASA is involved in. All right, so the International Space Station. Uh, the International Space Station is a cooperative, a multinational cooperative. Many countries around the world uh, built and uh, help to manage the International Space Station. Uh, the building of the International Space Station started in the 1990s. It was first inhabited by astronauts in November of the year 2000. So we're looking at uh, 20 years, 20 years of astronauts and cosmonauts continually living on the ISS. Now, they call missions expeditions. So currently, the current expedition is Expedition 63. One American and two Russians are currently on the International Space Station, traveling about 250 miles above the Earth and orbiting the Earth about every 90 minutes. All right. There are going to be two more astronauts joining the three astronauts that are currently up there in about nine days. And again, I'm going to be talking about that in just one moment. Now, very exciting. If you want to see the International Space Station from your home, it's very easy to do it. All you need to do is go to this web state, uh, website, spotthestation.nasa.com, and you can sign up for email alerts. And there's the sign up there. I'm not going to go through the process right now. All right, but here I'm going to show you what it looks like. Once you sign up for alerts, you will receive an email. And the email will tell you exactly when and where to look to spot the station in the sky. So, for example, this is from last year, May 19th. This email was telling me, normally you get the emails about 12 to, eight to 18 hours before it can be seen in your area. And this email tells me that I can see, I could see the International Space Station on Sunday, May 19th, starting at 8.33 p.m. in the evening. It will be visible for six minutes. And then this is how I find where to look for it. Basically, wherever you live, you need to know where your north, your east, your south, and your west are located. You also need to know degrees, 
from zero to 90. And that's it. If you know those things, then based on this email, you can go outside at the right time, look in the right direction, and what you will see is a little white dot going across the sky. This is a picture on the left-hand side that I took with my cell phone. Um, and you are certainly not going to see that when you look up. You're going to see a little white dot, all right? And so some people might think, well, gee, that's not very exciting. I'm going to see a little white dot go across the sky for three, four, five minutes. Uh, well, but when you think about what that little white dot is, that's when it becomes amazing. So right now, there are three human beings on that International Space Station, that little white dot that goes across the sky. Wow, I think that's pretty cool. All right, I'm looking at the chat box, and um, I'm going to be talking about Mars in a moment. I don't see any other questions, so we're going to push forward. And remember, we've got that chat box there. So if you have any questions, any comments, feel free to put them in there, and I will try to uh, address them as we go along. All right, let's uh, transition and talk a little bit about satellites. Um, so I mentioned earlier Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Both were launched in 1977. The primary mission of both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 was to explore the outer planets. All right. Well, guess what? They explored the outer planets. And they're going and going and still going, kind of like the Energizer rabbit, rabbit Bunny, if you remember that commercial from many years ago. Let me give you some very interesting statistics about Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. All right, when they first started, they both had 10 working instruments. Because these are not solar powered satellites, there is only so much power available. And so what NASA JPL has decided to do is to shut off certain instruments to conserve the energy to keep it moving and communicating back with NASA. So currently Voyager 1 has four of the ten instruments turned on and working while Voyager 2 has five instruments currently working. Voyager 1 it entered interstellar space, interstellar is between the stars, in August of 2012 and Voyager 2 entered interstellar space in November of 2018, so not too long ago. Now, get this, Voyager 1 has traveled about 13.8 billion miles from Earth. Voyager 2, about 11.4 billion miles from Earth. So they're really, really, really far away. Voyager 1 is traveling at about 38,000 miles per hour. Voyager 2 at about 34,000 miles per hour. So NASA communicates with Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 along with other satellites and rovers and landers using what's called the Deep Space Network. And the Deep Space Network is radio telescopes. There are three of them located in different countries around the world. Actually, there's one near Pasadena, Pasadena, California. There's one near Madrid, Spain. And the third and final one is near um, Canberra, Australia. So they're positioned all around the world. And regardless of where the Earth is rotating, they, there's always a radio telescope that is in line of sight, per se, with uh, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. It takes about 17 hours to send a one-way communication from JPL to Voyager 1 or Voyager 2. That's how far away that they are. It takes 17 hours via radio communication to get that uplink to the Voyagers. It also takes 17 hours to get a communication downlink from the Voyagers back to NASA. So you're talking about a 34-hour wait time between sending co commands and receiving information back. So they're really, really far. 
All right, on the right-hand side, we have a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched aboard Space Shuttle Discovery in April of 1990. So we are now celebrating 30 years of Hubble being in space. Hubble is about the size of a bus. It, orbit, it orbits the Earth about every 90 minutes at about 350 miles above the Earth going at about 17,500 miles per hour. Now, many of the pictures that you see when you see pictures from NASA, many of them will have come from the Hubble Space Telescope. Probably up today, the most famous of all of the telescopes NASA has had. This is perhaps the most important or impressive photo that Hubble has taken. And so here's basically what happened. Scientists decided to pick a spot in the sky that they thought was boring and they didn't think anything was there. And that they would focus Hubble, Hubble's mirrors and take multiple hours of images of that one spot in the boring sky. And after collecting hours and hours of data and merging that data together, those photos and images together, this is what we get. And in a very boring area of the sky, we end up seeing that there are approximately 10,000 galaxies in that very, very small sliver of the sky. I didn't say 10,000 stars. I said 10,000 galaxies. And of course, galaxies are made up of hundreds of billions of stars and exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet that is outside of our solar system. So we're talking about trillions and trillions and trillions of stars in these galaxies that we're looking at. And do keep in mind that this is just a very tiny, small section of the sky. So if there are 10,000 galaxies in that small section of the sky, we can probably safely assume that there are many more galaxies out in our known universe than we could ever, ever imagine. Very, very exciting. All right. Where do you sign up for ISS viewing email? You go to spotthestation.nasa.gov. Again, if you want to sign up so that you get email alerts about when you can see the International Space Station, go on the web, go to spotthestation.nasa.gov, and it will be very evident what you need to do to sign up. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about landers and rovers. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, you see the Mars Curiosity rover. It landed on Mars in August of 2012. One thing to keep in mind about these Mars rovers and landers, they are designed and expected to only last just a few weeks or maybe a couple months at best because there are so many challenges on Mars, including high radiation because of a lack of atmosphere, um, because of dust storms that will cover up things like the solar panels that will panel these, uh, that will uh, power these, excuse me. Um, but for many of them, they do end up lasting much, much longer than what they were designed or thought that they would. And Mars Curiosity rover is just an example. Uh, you can see that it is a rover. You can see that there are wheels on it. And so that means that it moves around. And to date, uh, Curiosity has traveled about 14 miles on planet Mars, on the Martian surface, which is pretty exciting taking uh, lots of pictures, doing lots of science. Uh, and you can go on to nasa.gov and see the pictures that it has taken and the type of science that it's currently doing. On the left-hand side of the screen, you see the Mars InSight lander. This landed on Mars in November of 2018. It is a lander, which means that if you look at the bottom of it, there are no wheels like on the rover on Curiosity. 
So when it lands, it lands, that's it. It stays in that one spot and that's where it will do its work. So it is extremely important that the engineers and the controllers and the scientists land it in the place that they want to land it because once it lands, that's it. There's nothing they can do to move it. Um, so the InSight lander, one of the exciting things about it is that if you look right here, this is a, uh, a digging mechanism. And the ultimate goal is hopefully to be able to drill down into the Martian surface up to 16 feet, 16 feet, okay? Now, if you do keep up with the news at all, they have had some issues and problems uh, drilling into the Martian soil. However, they are still continuing to work to resolve those problems. And what they do is they gather the soil and they do testing with onboard instruments. The ultimate goal with both the Curiosity rover and the Mars InSight lander is to look for either current or past life on Mars. They're probably not going to find a little green man with the antennas that we think about. Uh, if they find anything that's either living or that is a fossil that has passed away many years ago, it's probably going to be micro, uh, microbial life, microbial life, all right? But I think that will uh, be as good as anything. Life is life, it doesn't matter, big or small. All right, Mars 2020, NASA's newest Mars rover. It was recently back in March, it was named by a student in the, uh, the United States. It was named Perseverance. And Perseverance, you can see an image of it, an illustration on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, is scheduled to be launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida on July 17, 2020. Yup, that is only really weeks away. It is only weeks away. So definitely mark your calendar for July 17th, and you can go on um, nasa.gov, and you will probably be able to see live coverage of that launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Now, Mars 2020, or Perseverance, is going to land in the Jezero Crater on February 18th, 2021. So we're looking at, what, about eight months. The journey will be about eight months to get to Mars. And it all has to do with what is the position of Mars in relationship to Earth. And so every two years, there's an optimal time to launch things to Mars. And so July will be that optimal time. If for some reason it will not be able to be launched, they will probably have to wait until the summer of 2022 to launch the Mars rover, okay? Um, one of the major goals of Perseverance will be to cache soil samples for a future mission pickup and return to Earth. What they're going to do is they're going to gather soil from Mars. They're going to put it into containers and put them aside. And then a future mission will go and collect those soil samples and return them to Earth for extensive uh, uh, testing. There are only so many tests that can actually be done on these rovers like Curiosity and now Perseverance. So if we can actually get the soil samples back to Earth, we can do a lot more testing here than we can actually do with these robots on the planet itself. All right, very cool. On the right-hand side of your screen, you see Ingenuity. And Ingenuity will be the first helicopter ever used to explore anything beyond planet Earth. It actually got its name uh, just, just recently. Uh, so this is an illustration on the right-hand side, and Ingenuity will be, it's relatively small, it looks very large here, but Ingenuity will be able to, is actually, will fit up underneath the Mars rover right here. And so when it is landing, it will separate from uh, Perseverance, and it will have its own little mission. So it's really cool that JPL, and JPL is the one that designed and engineered Ingenuity, uh, will be uh, managing the mission of both Perseverance and Ingenuity. So 
Mark your calendar for February of next year, and we're going to get to see Ingenuity hopefully flying around on the planet Mars. All right. Let's turn to something very different, and that's NASA's Commercial Crew Program. All right. So let's start with um, what NASA's Commercial Crew Program is all about. When NASA decided that it was going to retire the Space Shuttle Program, it knew it had a problem. And the problem is, we still have American astronauts that need to go back and forth to the International Space Station. And without the Space Shuttle, how are we going to get them there? And how are we going to get them back? So for nine years, uh, we have been paying the Russian government to take American astronauts back and forth to the International Space Station. But NASA decided, why don't we uh, get American private companies to do the job? And so they awarded contracts to both Boeing and the United Launch Alliance and SpaceX to build and to ferry our astronauts back and forth. So this is something that has been in the works for many, many years now. Boeing uh, did a major test back in December of last year, December 20th, actually. Unfortunately, they were not able to meet their objective. And the objective was to send their crew capsule. And here is a picture of it right here. They call it the Starliner. And that is placed on top of a United Launch Alliance or a ULA uh, Atlas V rocket. So it would go right up there. It was supposed to go and dock with the International Space Station. But because of software problems, it never made it. And so... What Boeing has recently decided to do is once they work through these software problems, they're going to go through another complete launch of Starliners, Starliner. They're going to send it to the International Space Station, make sure that all of the systems work out properly, and then probably the next launch will include NASA astronauts. So unfortunately for Boeing, things have not been going very well. On the flip side... SpaceX. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see a Falcon 9 rocket. Over here, you see the Dragon crew. That's what they have named their capsule, where the astronauts will travel into space. This capsule will go onto the top of a Falcon 9 rocket and will blast off from the Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. And so SpaceX has been doing a lot of testing and things have gone much better for them than Boeing. And so there is a very, very big, exciting event coming up in eight days. And here's the big, exciting event. Crew demo number two, as SpaceX is calling it. We're sending two American astronauts in an American privately built rocket from American soil to the International Space Station. The launch is currently scheduled for Wednesday, May 27th, 2020 at 4.33 from Space Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Um, you see the two astronauts that will be going down at the bottom of your screen. On the right-hand side is Doug Hurley, and on the left-hand side is Bob Bankin. So those are the two astronauts that will be in that Drew Crag, Drew, that Crew Dragon um, in about eight days going to the International Space Station. So this is something that you definitely want to tune into. Go to nasa.gov on May 27th, and they will certainly be live broadcasting this. If you happen to live in the Florida area, maybe even South Georgia, you may want to step outside if it's clear that day, and you will be able to see the launch uh, from the Kennedy Space Center. I'm very fortunate in that I live south of Orlando, not far from the Walt Disney World Resort. I live about 50 miles as a bird flies to the Kennedy Space Center. So when there's a launch, all I have to do is walk outside my door and look up, and if it's clear, there it is. So I'm very excited and I hope that it's a clear day. But this is a very exciting time for NASA. 
that we are going to be able to shuttle our NASA astronauts back and forth with American private companies rather than depending on the Russians to do so. Launch America. All right. So what's coming up? There are two things that I'd like to talk about that's coming in the relatively near future with NASA. The James Webb Space Telescope, and someone earlier, I can't remember the name, was mentioning James Webb. The James Webb Space Telescope is basically the telescope that will be replacing the famous Hubble. It has been in production and planning for many, many, many years. Unfortunately, it has been delayed many, many, many times due to engineering issues and concerns. The launch is currently scheduled for 2021. It is scheduled to, it is, uh, it is planned to operate at about 1 million miles from the Earth. That's a long ways. Consider that the Hubble is only about, what, 250, 350 miles above the Earth orbiting us. This is a long ways, a million miles. And you might ask, why so far away? It has to work in very, very cold conditions. And if that telescope is close to the Earth, there's actually heat that is radiated off of the Earth that will negatively impact the workings of uh, James Webb. So they have to get it far away from the heat of the Earth. The James Webb Space Telescope will use infrared photography as opposed to visual photography. Why infrared? Well, infrared allows us to see through the clouds of dust and gas that are out in our solar system and in the universe. And there are interesting things that we want to see behind the clouds of dust and gas that we simply can't see with visual photography. And so this will allow us to peer through that gas and dust and see what's going on behind the scenes to see, for example, stars being born. So that's kind of an exciting thing. Now, I'm going to show you this short James Webb Space Telescope video. I often have problems showing it because it just doesn't want to load. So I'm going to give it a try and see if it will work for me. If it doesn't work after a couple tries, then I'm going to give it up. But it has something to do with where this video is hosted. And I apologize, but it is a great video, so let's give it a moment and see if it will work. See, it starts and then it stops and it starts and it stops. So. Space Telescope is the next premier space observatory. It will extend the discoveries of the Hubble Space Telescope and observe the birthplaces of planets, stars, and galaxies. It is named after James Webb, NASA's second administrator and champion of many NASA science missions. At three stories high and the size of a tennis court, this will be the largest telescope ever sent into space and a hundred times more powerful than Hubble. It is so big it has to fold to fit into the rocket only five and a half meters wide. And unfold segment by segment once in space. Webb's mirrors are coated with a super thin layer of gold that is about a thousand atoms thick to optimize their reflectivity in the infrared. Webb will launch from French Guiana. It is launched near the equator taking advantage of Earth's greater rotation speed there to boost launch performance. Webb will orbit the Sun one million miles from Earth at the second Sun-Earth Lagrange point. The telescope will observe infrared light with unprecedented sensitivity. It will see the first galaxies born after the Big Bang over 13 and a half billion Webb's infrared cameras are so sensitive. They must block light from the sun, earth, and moon. The five-layer sun shield is like having sunblock of SPF 1 million.
international mission. With contributions from the European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency. Scientists all over the world will be able to use Webb to explore further into space and back into time. Okay, so pretty exciting. Uh, by the way, the James Webb Space Telescope is named after NASA's second administrator, James Webb. Now I see that we are almost at the top of the hour, and as I promised earlier, I pretty much knew that I would go over that hour, so I do apologize. Uh, again, you will not offend me if you have to leave, but I hope that you can stick with me. I have one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that's the uh, Artemis program. And then I want to show you that really cool, those cool websites that I told you about. So please hang in there if you can. Uh, I do see a question earlier from Natalie about um, if I am aware of or take part in any research about uh, terraforming plants like Mars. Uh, unfortunately, I have not. And uh, I have not received any training on that, though I certainly would love to. And if I do... I will be uh, glad to pass that information on to you. So the last major real big thing that's coming up with NASA is what's called the Artemis program. For those that may not be familiar with it, Artis Artemis is the name of the new program when we return to the moon uh, based on Greek mythology. That's where the name's coming from. Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. And on the right hand side of your screen, you do see the official program logo. So in order to go back to uh, the moon, uh, NASA is developing an entirely new rocket system. And on the left-hand side, you see an illustration of what's called the Space Launch System, or the SLS, and the Orion Space Capsule. And the Orion Capsule will be right up here at the very top, and that's where the astronauts will ride to space. The SLS rocket uh, is a heavy lift deep space hardware rocket. What does that mean? It's really, really big and it's really, really powerful. Um, it will be much more powerful than the Apollo program Saturn V rockets and it will be, when completed, the most powerful rocket ever built in the world. It's evolvable. What does that mean? That means that it can be configured, as in the first two here, to carry astronauts or it could be configured to carry cargo. Artemis 1, which was originally called Exploration Mission 1, is scheduled for the fall of 2021. And I'm going to show you what the, um, what the planned path is in just a moment. Artemis 2 is scheduled for 2022 or 2023. Now, Artemis 1 will be... Um, the entire rocket system with the Orion capsule going around the moon and returning to Earth. No astronauts on board. Artemis II will include astronauts. However, they will not be landing on the moon. Artemis III, currently scheduled for 2024, will be the first landing of humans on the moon since 1972. NASA will be sending the first woman, yes, and the next man to land on the moon. This same rocket system will be used to go on to Mars in the 19, I'm sorry, in the 2030s. The Orion capsule that I spoke of earlier, uh, here's an illustration on the right hand side. It was built by Boeing. When it returns to Earth, after its mission to the moon or to Mars, it will be traveling at about 24,500 miles per hour. Consider that when the space shuttle returned from uh, orbiting uh, the Earth, it was traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. So this will be going significantly faster. Orion can accommodate up to five astronauts, though NASA currently only has four uh, uh, plans to carry four astronauts at any one time. All right, here's a quick little video about the Space Launch System and the Orion capsule. 
Fifty years ago, we pioneered a path to the moon. The trail we blazed cut through the fictions of science and showed us all what was possible. Today, our calling to explore is even greater. To go farther, we must be able to sustain missions of greater distance and duration. We must use the resources we find at our destinations. We must overcome radiation, isolation, gravity, and extreme environments like never before. These are the challenges we face to push the bounds of humanity. We're going to the moon to stay by 2024, and this is how. This all starts with the ability to get larger, heavier payloads off planet and beyond Earth's gravity. For this, we design an entirely new rocket. A space launch system. SLS will be the most powerful rocket ever developed. And with components in production. And more in testing. This system is capable of being the catalyst for deep space missions. We need a capsule that can support humans from launch through deep space and return safely back to Earth. For this, we've built Orion. This is NASA's next generation human space capsule. Using data from lunar orbiters that continue to reveal the moon's hazards and resources, we're currently developing an entirely new approach to landing and operating on the moon. Using our commercial partners to deliver science instruments and robotics to the surface, we are paving the way for human missions in 2024. Our charge is to go quickly and stay to press our collective efforts forward with a fervor that will see us return to the moon in a manner that is wholly different than 50 years ago. We want lunar landers that are reusable, that can land anywhere on the lunar surface. The simplest way to do so is to give them a platform in orbit around the moon from which to transition. An orbiting platform to host deep space experiments and be a waypoint for human capsules. We call this lunar outpost Gateway. The beauty of the gateway is that it can be moved between orbits. It will balance between the Earth and Moon's gravity. In a position that is ideal for launching even deeper space missions. In 2009, we learned that the Moon contains millions of tons of water ice. This ice can be extracted and purified for water. It can be separated in oxygen for breathing or hydrogen for rocket fuel. The Moon is quite uniquely suited to prepare us and propel us to Mars and beyond. This is what we are building. This is what we're training for. This we can replicate throughout the solar system. This is the next chapter of human space exploration. Humans are the most fragile element of this entire endeavor. And yet we go for humanity. We go to the moon and on to Mars to seek knowledge and understanding and to share it with all. We go knowing our efforts will create opportunities that cannot be foreseen. We go because we are destined to explore and see it with our own eyes. We turn towards the moon now, not as a conclusion, but as preparation, as a checkpoint toward all that lies beyond. Our greatest adventures remain ahead of us. We are going. We're going. We are going. We are going. We're going. I wish that I could take credit for um, producing those videos, but I can't. But I do think that NASA does an awesome job of um, promoting itself with that, uh, with those great uh, videos. Um, moon human landing system. So just in the last few days, NASA has announced that there are three companies that will be uh, engineering and building uh, the capability for humans to land back on the moon. And the contracts have gone to Dynetics, SpaceX, and a national team with Blue Origin leading up that set of companies. So I also have a very short little video that will tell you about this. Apollo led the way to the moon. And we, the Artemis generation, are going there to stay. Those of us in blue flight suits start of the Artemis generation of astronauts could not be more excited about contributing to our nation's goal of putting the first woman and the next man on the lunar surface by 2024. We, NASA, have been partnering with U.S. industry in order to achieve the best of 
what each organization brings. So without further ado, the companies are SpaceX. The SpaceX design is a single stage solution using their Starship. The SpaceX proposal included in space propellant transfer demonstration and uncrewed test landing. The second company is Dynetics. And Dynetics has many partners that they will be working with. It also has a very unique low slung crew module, putting the crew very close to the lunar surface for transfer and access. Dynetics will perform a demonstration flight to verify key capabilities for its lander system. And the third team is the national team with Blue Origin as the prime. The team's design is a three-stage architecture consisting of an ascent, descent, and transfer elements. With this diverse set of architectures, NASA is confident in our nation's ability to perform the Artemis missions. The landing on the moon in 2024 will be the most dangerous and complex flying task attempted by humans in more than 50 years. And it's only been done six times ever. That's why we're so excited about how to learn how to fly these landers so we can make that smooth touchdown on the lunar surface and do what we came for. Lunar surface exploration. Okay. I see that uh, Jeff says, sign me up. Um, yes, uh, sign me up too. What an awesome opportunity it would be to be able to go into space. And I think that one day, and I'm hoping that it's within my lifetime, um, it will be cost effective for people to catch a ride into space and to at least get some type of a glimpse. glimpse on what it lo looks like to look down upon the Earth. Diana asked a question about how large the SLS rocket is, and you can see here, depends on the, um, the uh, configuration. If you're talking about height, it can be 322 feet, 364, all the way up to uh, 365 feet. So it's gonna be a pretty, pretty tall rocket. And again, it will be the most powerful rocket ever built. All right, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, this is uh, EM-1 or Artemis-1. It is scheduled to take place um, next year, 2021. Uh, the space launch system with the Orion capsule will blast off from Kennedy Space Center, Launch Complex 39B, and go around the moon a couple times and return back to Earth, testing out all of the systems. No astronauts will be on board. The mission is expected to last between 26 and 42 days. I know there's a whole lot of stuff going on the screen, so that's kind of an overview of, of what it's showing us. Exploration Mission 2, or Artemis 2, is scheduled to take place sometime currently between 2022 and 2023. This mission will include four astronauts. It will launch from Kennedy Space Center. It will go around the moon. It will give the astronauts on board the opportunity to manually test out all of the systems with both the Orion capsule and the rocket. And its duration is going to be about 10 days. All right, they will not be landing on the moon. Artemis 3, which I do not have a copy of the, of the plan at this time. Again, currently scheduled for 2024, uh, will be landing on the moon. So some very exciting times coming up. All right, so um, I, uh, I am highly encouraged not to talk about what I wanna talk about right now, but I just find it to be so incredibly important to mention that I can't help but wanna mention it. And I think there are a lot of misconceptions about funding when it comes to NASA. So NASA gets blank percent of the total US federal budget. Here I have listed less than 1%, 7%, 13%, or more than 20% of the total U.S. federal government. Um, if you uh, could, just in the chat box, type which one you think it is, A, B, C, or D, and I'll give you a minute to do that. I see Jeff A, Stacy A, Edgar, 2012 A, uh, Lawrence A, yep. All right, so you've all got it. 
it's definitely less than 1%. It's actually less than a half of 1%. All right. So if you're looking at $1, you're looking at one half of one penny. Now, when you think about all of the things that NASA does with all of the missions that I talked about and the ones that I showed you, I personally think that that's a pretty good investment in, um, with our money. Um, enough said about that. All right. Now, I've got some really cool things that I want to show you. I want you to be able to experience NASA for yourself once we get done. So the first thing is NASA's website. Many of the things that I talked about, some of the things I showed you, pictures, some links to videos, can be seen on this website, nasa.gov. If you've never gone to this website, I highly encourage you to do it. You could spend many lifetimes going through all of the material that they have on this one website, nasa.gov. All right, you want to be a citizen sciences, scientist, as NASA calls it? You can. You can get involved. There are many what they call citizen science projects that you can take part in. For example, you can help NASA look for what's called exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet outside of our solar system. You can do... Uh, you can get involved with studies regarding clouds, land covers, and even mosquitoes. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of different projects that you as a private citizen that you can get involved in. So it's science.nasa.gov backslash citizen science. Okay, that's the website address to learn all about the projects that you can get involved in. Again, science.nasa.gov backslash citizen science, or simply go to Google and type in NASA citizen science, and it will take you right there. All right, the Center for Near Earth Object Studies. If you are concerned about an asteroid or something coming and hitting the Earth, well, NASA's got it covered and they are closely monitoring all kinds of objects that could come and hit the Earth. And if you want to see very specific data about what is of most concern at the moment, what is of concern coming in the coming days, weeks, and years, it is all on this website, cneos.jpl.nasa.gov, or simply go to, a, go to Google Type in Center for Near Earth Object Studies, NASA, and you will come to this website. Very fascinating website. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Observing with NASA. All right, are you interested in taking pictures of what's called, called DSOs or deep space objects like nebula and galaxies? You don't need your own telescope. You don't even need a camera. You don't even need to walk outside of your home. If you go to this website, there are certain deep sky objects that you can select from in the program. You can request that a uh, telescope take a picture of the item that you want to take a picture of, and then you will receive an email from NASA saying, okay, you've wanted a picture of this, from this telescope, it's taken a picture, and here it is. And so um, it's pretty neat to know that you can take pictures of deep space objects without even leaving the comfort of your own couch. So uh, in order to get to this website, just simply type in Observing with NASA. Observing with NASA. And you can go directly to this website. All right, and I have saved the best for last and that is NASA Eyes. And so I am going to take you to an app that I have on my computer top. Make sure that you can still see what I'm seeing here. Hopefully you can. And so if you go to NASA Eyes, just simply do a search, you will download an app, and then there are eyes on three different types of things. Eyes on the Earth, 
eyes on the solar system and eyes on exoplanets. And again, an exoplanet is a planet that is outside of our solar system. All right, so this is a really, really cool program. Highly recommend it. So right now we're kind of looking down at the solar system and you can see there's the sun and planet Mercury and Venus and Earth and here's Jupiter and so on and so forth. And you can scroll out so that you can see Pluto and Neptune and there's Voyager 2 and Voyager 1 is where there we go Voyager 1 is over here you can scroll in down here at the bottom you can let's say we want to pick a destination and we want to go to the Sun click on the Sun and click go and you will go right to the Sun it provides you just unlimited amounts of incredible, really exciting data about any object that you want to go to in our solar system, any satellite that's out there. You can fast forward in time. So if you want to see where, a, where Voyager 1 will be in 10 years, you can do that. You can go back 10 years and see where Voyager was back in the year, what, 2010? Uh, just an unlimited amount of things that you can do. I earlier mentioned the Parker Solar Probe, and there it is right there. So right now, whoops, I went in a little too, went too far. Let's see if I can bring it back out again. Parker Solar Probe uh, is a NASA satellite that is doing research on the sun. And so right now, this is the actual location of this probe. And again, we can go back in time or you can go forward in time and you can see how, let's see if we, I can do this real quick. Uh, I'm gonna change this to, let's say um, 2021. And now look at where Parker Solar Probe will be on May 19th, 2021, all right? If you just wanna go with, um, let's say, where will it be on December? 19th, uh, there you go. That's where it's going to be. All right. So some really, you can stay on this website for hours and hours playing around with uh, learning about all kinds of information related to our solar system. So it's called NASA Eyes and you can do a search for it. You download an app and you can open it up and just uh, look at all kinds of really cool things. All right, so we are getting ready to come to the end of the show. And so um, I'm going to be looking at the chat box here. This is our Q&A period. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask me, please feel free to do so. Uh, my eight-year-old asked why it's, uh, the funding is so tiny. Um, <laughs> why is NASA's funding so small? I guess there would be several reasons in that. Number one, there are not enough Americans that are truly interested in space exploration. If more Americans were interested in space exploration, more Americans would ask Congress to fund NASA at a much higher rate. Um, I think that's one of the major problems. Um, Congress is leery on giving NASA more money because it feels like people may not want to give NASA more money. But people kind of have to um, speak up. And um, if that's something that you want to see, then you need to contact your congressman and let him or her know to increase NASA's budget. Uh, is the sun producing less energy today as opposed to previous years? Um, I do not believe that it is producing less energy today than it did years ago. And when I say years, I'm talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of years. Now, if we went back millions and millions and millions of years ago as the sun was forming, well, that's a whole different story. But uh, the, the, the sun actually goes through cycles. It's an 11 year cycle. And right now we are kind of in the kind of in the valley of the cycle, which means that there's not a lot of um, lot of activity going on the sun 
but um, give it about another five years and we're going to have a lot more activity coming from the sun. Um, let's see. What are some companies that NASA works with? Uh, the big one, of course, right now would be SpaceX. NASA has done a lot of work with Boeing. Boeing built uh, both the Orion capsule and the Starliner that will be used to ferry astronauts back and forth from the International Space Station. Uh, there are other companies, as I mentioned earlier, like Blue Origin and Dynetics, uh, that NASA is working with to create lunar landers. So uh, they're kind of trying to get a lot of companies involved in creating and, um, and getting us to where we need to be. Um, how you were able to connect with libraries in order for them to post your link to the presentation. So how did I um, get to all of you? So many of you found out about this presentation through uh, your local library. And um, there is an organization called StarNet that works with libraries. And somebody at your library notified StarNet that during COVID-19, during our lockdown, that they'd like to know if somebody from NASA can talk about uh, missions. And so I found the email um, that they gave us and the contact names of people at libraries. And so I send out a bunch of emails and I'm so grateful that quite a number of people responded. And so uh, I love the libraries. I'm actually on the board of the Friends of the Library of the Orange County Library System here in Orlando, Florida. So I'm very passionate about libraries and I'm so, so glad that I got the response that I got. Um, let's see, I have a I have a presentation on an entirely different topic and subject, but would like to present to libraries. All right, found on Facebook, found on Facebook. That's one thing that I would like you to do if you've not already done so and you feel comfortable doing this. If you could please, in the chat box, tell me how you heard about tonight's or today's presentation that I've just done. Um, I'm very curious to find out um, if there are people just coming across this on uh, YouTube, or if you heard about it from a local library, or whatever the case may be. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. I, as I said earlier, I'm going to, because I'm really enjoying doing these YouTube live events, I'm going to put together monthly presentations about different topics. And again, the next one coming up will be, it's scheduled for Thursday, June 25th, from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. It's called What's Up at NASA. And then my first venture into a, um, a very specific topic will be on Thursday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, July the 28th from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm entitling it, Is There Life Beyond Earth? And so I'm very excited about that one. Also, if you have any things that you would like me to talk about, either put them in the chat so that I can put together a presentation in the future, or come back later and you can put them in the comment section of the video when it posts sometime tomorrow. All right, any other questions? Let's see, why did NASA send out Voyager 1 and 2 into space? Is it, is it to contact extraterrestrial life? So no, the major purpose of sending Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 was to simply explore the outer planets. Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Um, of course, there's always the desire to see if we can find life somewhere, um, but um, the goal was simply to get a big picture view of these uh, outer planets. Um, how do I, let's see here. Has NASA demonstrated that COVID-19 has decreased air pollution? Uh, I don't know if NASA has, but I saw something earlier today on the news that air pollution, uh, CO2, has decreased by, I think it was 19% due to COVID-19. So there's definitely a, um, a decrease. Terraforming, okay, Natalie, something I definitely um, keep in mind. How stable is Earth's axis and orbit? Um, pretty stable, all things considered. Um, we certainly don't want it to go awry and kind of go off on its own because it's not going to end well for us. But uh, all things considered, um, we're, doing, we're doing pretty good. All right. Um, so, uh, am I forgetting anything? Don't forget to subscribe. Again, 
I'm going to be posting short little one minute promo videos on my YouTube site and if you have notifications turned on you will know that I will be having another upcoming YouTube live and so you will know if you're interested and available to join me and I'd love for you to do so you will know when it is if you turn on notifications the little the bell I think many of you know what I'm talking about so I appreciate uh, all of you coming and spending some of your time with me tonight. Um, I thoroughly enjoy doing this. I hope that you learned something and um, I hope that I have spiked your curiosity and have kind of encouraged you to look up and to think about the universe that we live in. So again, I thank you so much for joining me tonight and uh, stay safe and stay well during these very bizarre times. And I hope to see you very soon back on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Have a great evening.